If you're anything like me, you not only love to indulge in anime because you get to experience different worlds and fantasies with lovable characters and creatures, but you might also love anime because of the deeper meanings and messages that the creators try to give to their audience with each and every episode. One anime that has variety of messages and deeper meanings behind it is Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood. Hiromu Arakawa, the creator of this show, leaves us many clues throughout that explicitly and implicitly give us a peek into her ideologies, specifically about human life, the human experience, and the value of humanity. She appeals to our emotions, she appeals to our sense of reasoning, and she establishes the credibility of her argument with different plots, subplots, character building strategies, and overall creates a very succinct and beautiful argument. I will critically analyze four main characters within the series, their unique elements that suggest certain crucial themes, and how these clues and elements interact with each other to construct Arakawa's beliefs about human life and the value of human existence. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is an action-adventure animated series that aired in Japan from April 2009 to July 2010. The show revolves around two brothers, Alphonse and Edward Elric, who live in a fantasy world where the fictional use of alchemy is the most advanced form of science. Those who use it are alchemists, and they can manipulate their surroundings based on their knowledge of alchemy paired with hand-drawn symbols referred throughout the show as transmutation circles. The basis of alchemy is known as alchemy's first law of equivalent exchange, which is, humankind cannot gain anything without first giving something in return. To obtain, something of equal value must be lost. So, an alchemist cannot create matter out of thin air, nor turn something into something completely different. For example, an alchemist can turn water into hydrogen and oxygen gases, but it cannot change water into blood. With the power of alchemy comes strict rules and taboos. One of these taboos is the creation of human life by a chemical means known as human transmutation. As children, the Elric brothers committed this taboo when they unsuccessfully attempted to bring back their mother from the dead. The price they paid was Alphonse's body and Edward's leg and arm. This fateful night marked the beginning of their journey to correct their mistakes and discover the true value of human life. I see. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. If there is any character that embodies these qualities, it is Trisha Elric. She was patient enough to wait for her husband until her death, and she was not envious of her husband's immortality or her children's knowledge of alchemy. She simply admired their talents and even rejoiced in the truth about her limitations as a human who will age and eventually die. By creating such a sympathetic character who embodies these qualities, Arakawa is defining the type of love that she values most, while appealing to her audience's emotions. Arakawa appeals to the ethos of her audience by providing the counter-arguments to valuing such love. One of the arguments is that this kind of love is weak and drives humans to commit foolish deeds. This is represented with the early death of Trisha, which was a result of being physically weak, and so she left her sons motherless. This loss drove them to desperation. They thought they had nothing left to lose, so they decided to perform human transmutation to revive her. Their attempt backfired and almost cost them their own lives. So if Trisha's love was so great, why did it drive her sons to commit this taboo? Because they were the actions of children who did not truly understand the love that nurtured them. The fact that Trisha could not be artificially brought back to life is an element of her character that suggests love itself cannot be artificially created. It must be learned through each individual human experience and nurtured by others. 
The Elric brothers' journey to regain their bodies and correct their mistakes becomes their journey to truly understand the love that their mother represented, the love that gives value to each human life. Nothing can become united with eternal and perfect life except that which is eternal and perfect. That which is good and perfect can continue to live. That which is evil and imperfect will be transformed. If all the elements constituting a man were good, if his whole emotional and intellectual constitution were perfect, such a man would be wholly immortal. If there is nothing good in him, he will have to die and to be wholly transformed. If a part of him is good and another part evil, the good portion will live and the evil one will perish. These are the teachings of Swiss German philosopher Paracelsus, also known as Philippus Aurelius Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, the historical figure whom the character Van Hohenheim is named after. Paracelsus learned the real world version of alchemy, surgery, and medicine during his youth, and later became known as the founder of toxicology. In the series, Van Hohenheim is a direct reference to his philosophical and alchemical teachings. He is the embodiment of what would happen if both good and bad elements of man were granted immortality. The elements of Hohenheim's source of immortality and his internal struggles suggest that true immortality is not stagnant but ever-changing through the lives and deaths of each passing generation. Hohenheim's source of immortality is revealed to be powered by the lives of 500,000 Xerxians, which is an element of his character that suggests how every immortal human life is part of the collective immortal life. By creating such a perverse version of immortality that is experienced through one human alone, Arakawa is able to distinguish it from the type of collective immortality that she values. Furthermore, Arakawa is able to present how she views death as a significant aspect to the value of human life. Throughout the series, the audience is allowed to view Hohenheim's inner struggles of defining his humanity while being stripped of the human quality of mortality. Hohenheim continually regards himself as a monster and other humans as weak because of this divide. This arrogant view of himself allows him to disassociate from any responsibility of being a part of the collective and therefore void of any responsibility to protect or cherish it. So, is he an arrogant, immortal monster? Does he lack the true human quality that could allow himself to be defined as a human? The battle between his arrogance and conscience proves otherwise. It not only appeals to the pathos of Arakawa's audience because they are shown the relatable struggle of valuing oneself as part of a collective, but it also suggests that change through one's own weaknesses is the immortal aspect of a human life that can live through others and become united with eternal and perfect life. Hohenheim is able to accept his role as a human when he accepts his own weaknesses. He may have had the power of over 500,000 human lifespans, but it wasn't until he understood the power of changing himself through the acceptance of his own humanity that he was able to live a fulfilling and mortal life. Tadaima, Toisha. Edward, my father, you were a son. You were a son, but... より長く生き続けるなんてしんどいことばかりだと思ってた。だけど君や息子たちに会えて生きててよかったと心から思えるようになった。充実した人生だった。そうさ、十分だ。ありがとう、トリシャ。でも、やっぱり死にたくねえって思っちゃうな。本当俺ってしょうがねえな。The outer form of a human is only caused by the action of life upon the astral form, the soul. And if the exterior form is broken, the inner form still continues to exist and can under certain conditions be brought back again into contact with the remnants of the broken form, and thereby that form may be revived. 
As a soul that travels from flesh to metal and back again, Alphonse is the embodiment of this philosophy. By separating the astral form from the external form, Arakawa is able to define the value of human life in terms of one's soul. With the lack of a human body, Alphonse does not sleep, eat, or require any other form of physical pleasure. The stimulation and motivation for his life is in the bonds he shares with others, his dreams, his aspirations, his goal to regain his body, and his desire to help others. He is also compassionate, innocent, pure, and has many childlike qualities. He is quick to pick up stray animals, and despite his cold body, he seems to have the warmest heart of the two brothers. He has a strong moral compass and does not hesitate to make decisions according to his values. These values include the dignity for the self and for other forms of life. Arakawa's audience is able to relate to Alphonse not through his physical form, but through the emotional and mental expressions of the soul that he represents. This appeal to pathos allows Arakawa to present the definition of the soul as one that has the potential to carry these qualities. Arakawa appeals to the ethos of her viewers by presenting the counter-argument to this definition of the human soul, when Alphonse and Edward interact with Barry and number 48 in episode 8 of the series. These characters are in the same fleshless state as Alphonse, but are murderers who do not carry the same moral compass or compassionate soul. So, can they too be regarded as human, or are they monsters who should cease to exist? Even though they are completely opposite to Alphonse's character, Arakawa still considers them every bit as human as he is. Arakawa expresses this through Edward's reluctance to kill number 48, who laughs at being treated as a human in his metallic condition, when he was considered a murderous monster in his past human form. She appeals to the logos of her audience when Edward goes on to say that if he did not consider number 48 as human, then by default, he would consider his own brother as inhuman. By defining Alphonse as human through an appeal to pathos, she can persuade her audience to accept murderers as also being human through this logical approach. So what about Alphonse is human if it is not his compassion or emotions? To answer this question, Arakawa challenges Alphonse's humanity when Barry suggests that Alphonse might be an armored doll with fabricated memories that Edward created. Although Alphonse states that he is indeed human, Barry laughs and asks, how can you be so sure? With Barry's confrontation, Alphonse starts to doubt even his own memories and whether he fulfills the requirements to call himself human at all. It isn't until the next episode when it is revealed that Alphonse shares memories with others that he does not share with Edward are his doubts clear. If Edward had fabricated Alphonse's memories, then sharing memories with others without sharing them with Edward would not be possible. This realization implicitly states Arakawa's view on human existence as a shared experience. The fact that these bonds and memories cannot be fabricated through alchemical means suggests Arakawa's interpersonal perspective of the human soul. The soul's will to live, powered by its bonds with others, is one of the aspects that renders it priceless and imperative to human life and existence. <laughs> でも振られた。あ、ああ、そう。全部嘘だって言うのかよ。ごめん。どんなことしても元の体に戻りたいって。あの気持ちも作り物だって言うのか。作り物じゃない。そうだ。絶対に二人で元に戻るって決めたんだ
Aren't you supposed to be a Sophos? As in the wisest? Isn't that how people refer to you? Pythagoras answered, I am not a Sophos, I am only a philosopher, meaning, I am only a philosopher. That was the very first time the word philosopher was uttered, so naturally the king had to ask, What do you mean by a philosopher? To answer the king's question, Pythagoras told the king a metaphorical story that goes like this. Imagine a room. Imagine that its doors and windows are all closed. Imagine that inside the room, you will find gods and goddesses. Imagine outside the room, standing at the door, there is a human being. This human being knocks at the door. Someone inside, a god or a goddess, opens the door just a tiny bit, just enough to see who is knocking. And upon seeing that the one who is knocking is only a human, neither a god nor a goddess, the door is immediately closed. The person knocks again and again, and the result is the same. That is, the door is open just a tiny bit, just enough to see who is knocking, and upon seeing that it is only a human being, the door is immediately closed. After telling his story, Pythagoras turned to the king to finally answer the king's question about what it means to be a philosopher. According to Pythagoras, to be a philosopher is to be like a human being who is constantly knocking at the door. In Arakawa's fictional story, Edward Elric is a direct representation of a philosopher as he knocks at the gate of truth a total of four times throughout the series. With each time, Arakawa challenges the idea of the human's ability to obtain true knowledge. Instead of becoming closer to his goal of obtaining the power of truth, he is faced with the limitations of his own human perspective. Edward's dependence and glorification of alchemy to covet its truth and power is what caused him in the beginning of the series, to seek the answers to all his problems through alchemy. He thought there was an absolute truth that holds all the answers to his own weaknesses and shortcomings. When he finally realizes that there are more ways of discovering truth and that an absolute truth that he alone can understand does not exist, he gives up his access to it by exchanging his gateway of truth for his brother's body. Through Edward's philosophical development and personal growth, Arakawa is expressing her own value of the truth through one's own experiences and limitations as part of the value each human life holds. だけど江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。江戸。
Ben Hohenheim not only being the father, but also demonstrating to us the pitfalls of this incorrect view of immortality as being something to be highly coveted as it was throughout the show by various characters, and also even putting into question the value of this Philosopher's Stone by weighing it against the value of mortality and human experience. Then we have Alphonse Elric, the wandering soul, the bodiless human, who demonstrates to us the parts of our humanity that aren't tied to flesh or blood, but tied to the soul, to our interpersonal connections and our shared experiences with others. And finally, we have Edward Elric, who is also the philosopher or the wisdom-loving human in this story, who learns to love himself and his own humanity above the wisdom that he sought to find. So that's all I have to say for now. Thank you so much for sticking through to the end. If you're still here, I truly appreciate you because this video is different from my other videos on this channel. And I actually created it in 2016, but I never had the guts to publish it because I was really nervous. I didn't feel confident about it. And now that I look back, I realized that I put a lot of hard work into it. And so I decided to share it with you all while you wait for my future videos and my regular content. So if this is something you'd like to see more of, go ahead and let me know. But just know that I will be continuing my regular content soon. And I just really appreciate you all for sticking around, for subscribing, for liking. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.